We're talking today with J.P. Meyer of Grand Island, Nebraska. We are at the 2018 Ripcord Reunion. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. All right, uh, J.P., start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born January 5th, 1947 in Marshalltown, Iowa. All right. <coughs> uh, now, did you grow up there or did you move around? Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm in a small community about 25 miles north of Marshalltown called Wellsburg, Iowa. Okay. And what part of Iowa is that in? Central part. Okay. All right. Uh, and did you finish high school? I did. When did you graduate? Uh, 1965. Okay. <coughs> and then what did you do after you got out of high school? I enrolled at South Dakota State University in pre-pharmacy. Okay. And then how long did you stay there? I was there till April of um, 1968. Okay. And did you complete your program there? or I completed it after my active duty Army time. Okay. Uh, so how is it that you wound up in the Army? I dropped out of school and uh, I wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. I had taken flying lessons while I was at South Dakota State. So I uh, actually went down to the Air National Guard unit in Sioux Falls mm -hmm. and got on their wait list for pilot training. I was number 102 on the wait list, so it didn't look very likely that I was going to go to Air Force pilot training, and they required four years of college. Mm -hmm. The Army would uh, allow you to go through the Warrant Officer Flight Training Program if you had a certain number of semester hours of college credit, which I had. So I went down to the post office in Brookings, South Dakota on April 26th and enlisted in the Army for the Warrant Officer Flight Training Program. All right. Now, um, a lot of people probably don't even know what a Warrant Officer is, so can you explain that? Well, the Warrant Officers are, um, I guess you would consider them technical type officers. They were in the supply field. Uh, logistics, um, and of course during the Vietnam War most of the warrant officers were helicopter pilots. All right. And how do they compare with standard commissioned officers? We were below the, the regular commissioned officers. There were At the time there were four grades of warrant officer. They've since expanded that as I understand, but uh, back then there was the grades were W1 through W4. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And you could do this without going through all the things involved in becoming an officer, but you still get yes. your own things. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, we went through a different type of program. Okay. Now, when you signed up, how many years were you signing up for? Uh, you know, I honestly don't remember. We had an obligation after flight training, mm -hmm. but I, I can't remember exactly what it was. Okay. All right. So, uh, now where do they uh, send? Now, do you do a regular Army basic training first, or do they send you? I went to basic training at Fort Polk, Louisiana in August. Um, it was very hot. And uh, from there, when we finished basic training, I went to uh, Fort Walters, Texas for primary helicopter school. Okay. So the uh, training at Fort Polk, that was standard Army basic training? Yes. So what was that like, other than hot? It, it was miserable. It was, uh, after I'd been to Fort Polk for um, about six weeks, uh, I, you just, you're so entrenched in basic training, you really don't think about anything else. Um, it was, uh, it was hot and, like I said, pretty miserable. Okay. Well, how did the instructors treat you? Like a typical drill sergeant back in that day and age. They'd be in your face screaming. You'd be standing in attention. Um, they didn't physically uh, touch us or hurt us, but you were always thinking that they would if they had to. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how. That's that's what the environment was like back then. Okay. And uh, how much of the emphasis was just on drill and discipline? All of it. Basically, you did what the army told you to do, and uh, they were. Uh, I guess developing a mindset of what they were looking for in a soldier. Okay. Now, were you training alongside uh, people who were draftees, or were they all enlistees, or do you not know? There was a mix. Okay. We, had, we had a lot of draftees. <clears throat> and how did the uh, other guys respond to the treatment? Um, we had a couple of guys that, we had one particular guy from uh, Mississippi who was a little on the heavy side, and on, I know on one of our marches, he just fell out. He couldn't go anymore. 
Um, but everybody was kind of in their own world and struggled to get through it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, um, the, the environment just gives you a certain mindset like, okay, here's what we're going to do next. Mm -hmm. And then you always look forward to getting through for the day so you could get some rest. And of course the barracks were unair conditioned and you'd wake up with your sheets wet in the morning from sweating all night. Uh, it was hot. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now how long did that last? Eight weeks. Okay. All right. And then your next step from there? Uh, from basic training, I went to Fort Walters, Texas. <clears throat> they took us by bus from uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana to Fort Walters. And we got, a, we got to Fort Walters and the uh, TAC officer, as they were called, got on the bus and was wearing a shiny helmet liner carrying a, I think it was some kind of 40 millimeter round all polished up and tapping it in his hand and being very nice and saying, uh, welcome gentlemen to Fort Walters, Texas. You're here for your basic primary helicopter training. And then he just started screaming at us and he says, now you have 20 seconds to get your, you know what, off this bus and get in formation. And we were in formation in the street and it was hot in Texas during, in August and September. And uh, we had one gentleman who was prior service, as they say, had uh, medals on and had a, I think he was a staff sergeant actually. And the drill sergeant came by and ripped his medals off his shirt and ripped the stripes off his sleeve. And he says, you're now a warrant officer candidate. And you're lower than whale shit on the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was, the first four weeks of helicopter, primary helicopter school are, um, I guess you'd call it indoctrination. We didn't fly, we went to class, mm -hmm. and we were harassed a lot. Middle Inspections in the middle of the night, get out in the street, you're standing out there in the dark at two o'clock in the morning in formation, and uh, they're going through and inspecting the troops, the, the TAC officer would, and then he'd tell you, you've got five minutes to get back upstairs, change into your class A's and get back out here. So we'd go change uniforms and come right back out and get inspected again. That lasted for the first four weeks. And then <clears throat> once we started flight training, we had to get crew rest. They were required to give us a certain number of hours of sleep before mm -hmm. we could do anything else. And uh, so the harassment, uh, wasn't nearly as intense after that. All right. Uh, now, the so what are you actually learning in the first four weeks? Um, well, you're learning in class. We're learning about the helicopter and how it's built, how it operates. Um, learning basic um, flying information, navigation, um, what airspeed means, and and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you learn a certain amount of um, they, they went through the checklist and we learned how to start the helicopter. We learned how to pre-flight it, look for defects. Um, so were you getting into helicopters but not flying them? Or no, we weren't, we weren't allowed on the flight line the first four weeks. Okay. Uh, we had one individual who, wh who was in our barracks and as I recall, his name was Jackie Wilson from Fort Worth. We had our helmets issued to us, and we had them up on the top of our lockers. And one day after class, Jackie got his helmet out, and everybody asked him, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm going flying. And he went to the flight line, and he got in a TH-55, and he got it started. I think, as I recall, he had to have a maintenance man help him get it started. And he got it up to flying speed and picked it up to a hover. And of course, he didn't know how to fly a helicopter, but now he's at a hover in a TH-55. Um, and from what I'm told, he, he 
actually what he he thought was it started vibrating real bad and there's there's a condition called um, ground resonance in a TH55 and the, the solution for that is to get it off the ground pick it up he thought he was getting into ground resonance so he picked it up to a hover and now he's at a hover and obviously he doesn't know how to fly a helicopter because he hasn't been trained yet and they say he he got it back to the ground and he bounced on one skid bounced on the other skid and then turned it on its side and destroyed it he survived, and I think, as I recall, he got court-martialed. Mm -hmm. okay. So that was an interesting event in our first four weeks of pilot training at Fort Walters. All right. Uh, now, so for the rest of you, uh, now, did people wash out of those first four weeks? Or did everyone Not get that through? I recall. I think we all, we all made it through the first four weeks. All right. Okay, so now they actually put you in a helicopter, and do you start flying right away, at least with an instructor? Mm -hmm. or, okay. So how does that process work? Well, we all go out to the we went out to the flight line. We each were assigned to an instructor, and my instructor was the the flight commander. Um, so I, a, a lot of the students, uh, flew to the stage field. We went from the main heliport in Fort Walters to different stage fields for training for mm -hmm. to practice, and my uh, and and many of the students were bussed out. My instructor was the f uh, flight commander, so. He and I got in a helicopter, that was my first helicopter ride in the military, and flew from there to the stage field, which was uh, north of Fort Walters, about, oh, I'm guessing seven or eight or nine miles. Okay. Were you using a TH-55s at that point? I was in the Hiller, OH-23. Okay. Describe that as what, what as a machine relative to the TH-55s. Uh, uh, the, the Hiller is um, probably... <clears throat> 50% larger than the TH-55. The TH-55 is a very small helicopter. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hiller was had a bubble like the old um, Bell helicopters. When I describe the helicopters that I flew back then, I asked people if they remember the old TV show, The Whirlybirds, because it had the big glass bubble. It was a two-seat helicopter mm -hmm. um, with a reciprocating engine. Um, had a tail boom that slanted up the TH-55's tail boom went straight back and um, it was a two-bladed um, helicopter and vibrated a lot. My first, Im my first impression when the instructor picked the helicopter up to a hover, I felt like I, I was trying to bounce, and I wasn't flying it, but the sensation I had was trying to stand on top of a basketball on a pogo stick. <laughs> That's what it felt like. <laughs> So, I, you know, your thought is, how am I ever going to learn to fly this machine? Um, but we did. Okay. So how does he go about teaching you? Uh, we'd go out to a stage field that had, uh, I think they each had four lanes. And you would hover down the lane. He'd, he'd teach you to hover first, and we did that off to the side of the lanes. Mm -hmm. And you could tell students who, when a student was flying and when an instructor was flying because when the student, new students would take the controls, you'd see the helicopter start to drift in all different directions and back and side and forward and all of a sudden it, it would go right back to where it started and you knew that the instructor took the controls at that point. Mm -hmm. And you just basically did that over and over until you got the feel for how to fly a helicopter mm -hmm. and it kind of became a natural thing like when you try to learn to ride a bike. All right. Uh, and so how long then were you doing that? Uh, we were, <clears throat> well, it, the, the, the entire primary helicopter phase lasted in, uh, from, uh, I guess we started flying in September, and we finished, as I recall, in late December. Um, and, and we learned to hover, and then we would take off and fly traffic patterns. And after a while, when the instructor felt like you were safe enough, he would get out, and you'd have your first solo. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I think I soloed the helicopter. I think I had nine hours of flight time. Um, and I remember being at downwind the first time I soloed, looking down and f flying this machine that was shaking and thinking, "When the hell are you doing up here, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how to operate this machine." But I got it back on the ground safely, and <clears throat> after a while, it just became very natural. All right. Uh, and 
in that that level of training? Uh, did other people have accidents, or did everyone get through? Um, there were there were accidents. There were mid-air collisions. Um, I was we were on a night flight, a solo night flight, one time, and uh, there was a student in a TH-55 that apparently was lost. <clears throat> I was coming into Walters, Maine from the north, and they were talking about him on the radio, but they couldn't get him to reorient himself. And then I saw a flash of light off to the east, and um, he had flown through some high tension wires, and the, the aircraft hit the ground and exploded. He was burned very badly. He s survived the crash, but died in the hospital. Um, Do you think you were better off because you had uh, the commander train you? Was he? No, all the instructors are extremely talented mm -hmm. people. Uh, good helicopter pilots, good instructor pilots. Okay. Some of them were a little more aggressive than others. <coughs> and the, <coughs> excuse me, the commander just flew to the stage field with me. He wasn't my regular instructor. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so now when you complete that, now do you move on to more advanced helicopters? When we completed our training at Fort Walters, we, we moved to Fort Rucker, Alabama. And we started out in uh, the Bell uh, TH-13 um, in instrument training. We did our instrument training there at Shell Field um, outside of Enterprise, Alabama. And then once we finished instrument training, we moved on to tactical training, and that was done in Hueys. We learned to fly the Huey. Mm -hmm. Now with the instrument training, are you actually flying a helicopter and relying on instruments, or are you on the ground? No, you're in the helicopter under a hood. Okay. And uh, flying just by reference to the instruments. You're actually not qualified. As a student, mm -hmm. we weren't actually qualified in the TH-13. We just flew it with an instructor for instrument training, and all of that training was with an instructor. There okay. was no solo time. All right. <coughs> but then you move on to the Huey. Now, how is the Huey different from the other things you had flown? <coughs> it was a lot bigger. Um, and it had, it was a much more modern helicopter, had uh, better instruments. Um, and it was fully instrumented in terms of flying in the clouds. Mm -hmm. um, and just a lot bigger, heavier machine. And it had a turbine engine instead of a reciprocating engine. In a reciprocating engine helicopter, part of what you have to do when you fly it is manage the RPM. And you do that manually with a throttle that's on the collective. In a Huey, it had a governor on the turbine engine, which would maintain a certain RPM, so you didn't have to worry about twisting a throttle. Uh, you just pull you pull pitch, and as you pull pitch, the engine would develop more power to compensate mm -hmm. for the increased power requirement. All right. Uh, and how long now do you spend uh, at Fort Rucker? Well, we spent the rest of our training at Fort Rucker, and we graduated in May of 1970. <coughs> I'm sorry, 69, 1969. And then um, I went from flight training direct to Chinook transition. <coughs> um, when I was at Fort Walters, we had a Chinook fly over the field one day, and I, I was just fascinated with that helicopter. And I like big machinery. Mm -hmm. And so I went in to see my TAC officer, which was um, not something you typically did back then. You didn't want to see your TAC officer. Mm -hmm. But I went in to see him, and uh, asked him how I could get into Chinooks. <clears throat> he said, well, Meyer, I'll tell you what, here's how it works. You're going to graduate from pilot training, you're going to fly Hueys in Vietnam, and if you survive that year, you can come back and we'll send you to Chinook transition if that's what you want to do, and then we'll send you back to Vietnam to fly Chinooks for a year. And uh, I said, well, some students get Chinook training right out of pilot training. He said, oh, yeah, if you graduate first in your class, you might get a Chinook transition. So I said, thank you, that's all I wanted to know. And I started gunning, studying. I, I had a pilot's license when I went to the Army. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I basically knew how to fly. And I started 
studying under the covers at night with a flashlight in the barracks after lights out. And I graduated first in my class mm -hmm. when we finished at Fort Rucker. And we got one Chinook allocation. So I took it. And what that did, uh, the Army decided not long before we graduated that if you got a certain transition, and Chinook was one of them, you had to sign up voluntary indefinite status, which means the Army had you as long as they wanted you. Um, but I thought the trade-off was worth it. So I had some of my classmates ask me, now what are you going to do, Meyer? I said, I'm going voluntary indefinite because I'm going to Chinook transition. Because um, by then you've heard about all the, we had heard about all the Hueys. Well, I knew when I went into helicopters that it was very risky. Mm -hmm. And it was an automatic ticket pretty much to going to Vietnam, flying helicopters. <clears throat> so I thought flying Chinooks would be a lot safer than flying Hueys. All right. Uh, so now, uh, do you go then go on to Chinook training? I went to Chinook transition and then uh, went to Vietnam in August <coughs> of uh, of 1969. Yeah. Okay. So August of 69. So I guess when we were uh, well, originally uh, recording your dates and so forth, so you would have been enlisted in '68 then. I enlisted in '68. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Okay, so the Chinook transition, I mean, how long does that take, or how complicated was that? Uh, it was, uh, as, as I recall, it was a six-week transition, six or seven weeks. Um, well, the Chinook is a very large helicopter. Uh, has two engines, two rotor systems, and it's not a conventional helicopter. It's a tandem rotor helicopter, so uh, it flies a little bit differently. Um, in most respects, it's easier to fly because you don't have the anti-torque system to, to worry about. Um, it had a stabilization system because the rotors are equal in size, so the back rotor wants to fly as fast as the front rotor. Mm -hmm. So without the stabilization system, it became very unstable in yaw, and it was a little bit tricky. Uh, Boeing made some design changes to it when they developed a B and C model. But the A model was pretty squirrely, as we call it, if, <laughs> if the stabilization, stabilization system was turned off. All right. Now, over the course of your training, you've been in Texas, you've been in Alabama, and where do they do the Chinook training? In Alabama. Uh, Fort Alabama. Rucker. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, you're, in, you're, now, you know, you're now down south here in the area that is sort of still in the process of desegregating. I mean, did you notice a different way of life in those places, or did you just stay focused on what you were doing? Not then. Um, I noticed that after I got back from Vietnam and was stationed at Fort Rucker. Okay. All right. But at this point, it's just all helicopters. All, all concentrated on learning to fly helicopters and and being in the military. Okay. And once you complete the Chinook training, do you get some uh, time off before you go to Vietnam? Or uh, I had a month of leave before I left for Vietnam. Okay. And did you just go back home at that point? Mm -hmm. Went back home to Iowa. All right. Now, how did your family feel about your heading off to Vietnam? Um, well, when I signed up, I didn't ask my parents. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, thinking back when my son was my age when I signed up, thinking about him doing that, I realized how much stress I created for my parents. Uh, my dad, um, of course, I had already signed up, mm -hmm. so there wasn't anything that anybody could do about it, but he was concerned. He said, don't you know they're shooting them, those helicopters down? And I said, yeah, I know. But if your time is up, your time is up. That was kind of my, I had a fatalistic attitude at that point, I guess. All right. And as you're preparing to go to Vietnam, how much did you know about what was going on over there? Uh, during the month that I was home <coughs> on leave, um, Quezon was under siege, and uh, I was glued to the TV watching uh, those events daily. Because <clears throat> um, okay. Quezon was in 1968. But it was, well, maybe it was 68 when I was, before I entered. It, that may that, that might have been before, before, that was before you entered, yeah. 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 So you're aware of that. Yeah. And then 69, there was Hamburger Hill that <clears throat> summer. Yeah. Uh, 
that sort of thing. But regardless, you're watching. You are you're watching the news at that point. Yeah. And, Realizing that I'm going to be over there in 30 days. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, how do they physically get you to Vietnam? I got on a flight in Des Moines and flew to uh, California, the Oakland Overseas Replacement Station, mm -hmm. and got on a stretch eight, DC eight, and we flew to. It was either Okinawa or Guam. I think it was Okinawa to refuel <coughs> from California. Mm -hmm. The first airplane ride I ever was on it that had a movie, and the movie was Support Your Local Sheriff with James Garner. <laughs> I, I, I still remember that, and I've got that video at home. <laughs> um, so, and we landed at, uh, we landed in Saigon uh, at Thompson Air mm -hmm. Force Base, and I don't know, I guess my thought was when we got off the airplane there'd be rockets landing and and bullets flying and it was just hot and, st and it stunk mm -hmm. um, and then we went through overseas replacement training with the 101st Airborne Division. Okay now did you do that um, down at Saigon or did you get up to where the 101st was first? We did that in Saigon they had a training um, location there. Okay. They called it search training, screaming yeah. eagle replacement training. All right and what did that actually consist of? Oh, indoctrination about the um, Viet Cong and the NBA, um, how they would set booby traps. Um, <clears throat> um, I think we actually went on a, a mini patrol mm -hmm. while we were there. Um, they had a, they had wooden bleachers and had an instructor on a short stage out in front of us, probably 20 feet in front of us. And he um, was talking about how the Vietnam would sneak up on you and throw satchel charges and booby traps. And then he kind of led up to it dramatically and then he, he kicked a, in front of him, against a, a, a wooden, like a two by six or something, we couldn't see it from our side, but there was a little detonator there, and he'd kick that, and and they would, they had grenade simulators, and he'd explode those, and it just scared the bejesus out of us, pretty sudden, and I, and I actually heard after, uh, after I got, and uh, after I talked to some of the guys that I trained in helicopter training with it. We had two students from my class that were sitting in the front row, and the um, uh, the Viet Cong had snuck in there the night before and put live grenades. What he would do is he'd take a fake grenade, he'd pull the pin and throw it out in front of right in front of the students or the, the mm -hmm. troops, and they'd they'd snuck in and put live grenades in his box. So he pulled the pin on a live grenade and threw it out and, and uh, killed one of my my uh, helicopter classmates. Mm -hmm. um, so that was uh, the harsh reality of Vietnam mm -hmm. from the start. Okay, all right. So now, um, once you go through that training, now what happens? Well, we got together in a group and we got our assignments. And uh, when they called my name, they said, Meyer, you're going up to Charlie Company, 159th Aviation Battalion in I Corps. And I said, 101st, they don't have helicopters. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, there was a guy, a group of guys that were going home. And somebody overheard me say that. And he says, yes, they do. I just came from there. Mm -hmm. So I went up to uh, Fubai and joined the Charlie Company, the one. 59th. Okay. How did they get you to Fubai? As I recall, we got it there in a C-130. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a military transport mm -hmm. plane. Okay. Uh, and then what kind of reception do you get when you join your unit? Uh, you get welcome to the unit and here's your room. <coughs> they put me in a room that was vacant and there was a set of fatigues in the closet. Um, the fatigues were had the name Dives on it. And I said, who's Dives? And the guy that checked me in says, oh, you don't have to worry about that. And he took the fatigues out. 
Well, Tom Dives had been killed in a mid-air collision just, I think, just a couple of weeks before I got there. Mm -hmm. So they moved me into his room because it was empty. Mm -hmm. um, so did you have private rooms in the, bar in the barracks? We each had a roommate. Okay. We were two to a, a, a hooch, we mm -hmm. called it. The, the buildings were plywood. Uh, there were, I, there were, I think, there were four rooms on each side of each building. So there were 16 uh, pilots in one building, and we had a total of 32 pilots, as I recall. So we had two buildings in the in the what we called the officers area. Mm -hmm. We had a little officers club and the two barracks, and then our commander had his own barracks building. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. and. And so there's four companies in the battalion, is that right? Or there's th there's four companies. There were three Chinook companies in the uh, 159th Battalion and a crane company that was located in Da Nang. Okay. All right, So, you, but your three companies were basically together. All in Fubai. Yeah, all in Fubai. Okay. Uh, and then how many aircraft? I'm sorry. The, the Charlie company was at Fubai. Yeah. Um, Alpha and Bravo companies were at Camp. Eagle. Okay. Uh, so you were at the Fubai airport and they were at Camp, because Camp, Camp Eagle is near Fubai, but Correct. it's not the same. Yeah. Okay. Not the same right. location. <coughs> All right. So you've got your own. Again, how many aircraft did you have? 16. Okay. So 16. And, would you, and then with the 32 pilots then, um, if all 16 were flying, all of you would be flying. Technically, we could, we could man all the aircraft. Yeah. Because you had to have a pilot and a co-pilot for each one. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, now, how quickly do you start flying? Um, as I recall, we we were flying within a week. Mm -hmm. And how do they work in the new guys? You flew with an experienced aircraft commander initially. Uh, you were called a Peter pilot. Mm -hmm. And you had to have a certain number of hours before you would qualify to be an aircraft commander. Um, I can't remember what, the, I think it was 100. I can't remember exactly what that hour requirement was. But if you, we became short on uh, aircraft commanders to man the aircraft for the missions. So if you had a, cert a certain amount of experience and were considered um, safe to do so, you were, you were named first pilot. Mm -hmm. So you flew, you were technically the aircraft commander, but you weren't logging aircraft commander time because you didn't have enough time to do that, so you were logging first pilot time with a co-pilot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you're you're starting out with the uh, aircraft commander, going to gradually give you more responsibility, or so you'd start to yes. do more of the actual flying in mm -hmm. that in that period. Now, uh, under normal circumstances, what does the co-pilot actually do? Uh, monitor the the systems, monitor the rotor RPM, and the the gauges and do a certain amount of flying and as you spent more time there you flew more and more mm -hmm. you typically didn't talk on the radio that was the aircraft commander's job um, we all had nicknames and I got my nickname it was Lurch one day when my aircraft commander was busy talking to the crew and one of the other aircraft was asking my aircraft commander a question or something about something and I answered on the radio and apparently my voice was very deep <laughs> and the other aircraft commander said, who is that? It sounds like Lurch. <laughs> and that's how I got my nickname. And you're referring to the character in the Adams Family yes. TV series? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, now, so um, when do you actually start flying in Vietnam? What month was it when you were doing that? Um, well, I started flying in August of 69. Okay. Uh, now, was there um, a lot of stuff going on at that point, or were things quieting down? Um, at that point in time, as I recall, we were doing a lot of missions out into the Ashaw Valley, mm -hmm. and uh, Fireblade, Firebase Rendezvous was the main uh, fire base in the Ashaw Valley that we resupplied. Mm -hmm. um, and then we resupplied 
Birmingham and Burgess Garden, as I recall. There were two air, there were two fire bases before we would get out mm -hmm. to uh, the Ashaw. Yeah, because you have them in the, in the chain of hills that separates the Ashaw from the, the coastal plain. Yes. That, that's where those those two bases were. Yes. The rendezvous was in it. Now, was it dangerous to fly into the Ashaw? It didn't feel like it at the time, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, there weren't, uh, when they sent Chinooks out on what they considered dangerous missions, they would send two Cobra gunships with us. Mm -hmm. I don't recall ever needing escort um, for that first six months I was there. Okay. Well, I think, so well, August would be after Hamburger Hill and a lot of the NVA had kind of pulled out or pulled back for the time being. Uh, yeah, the Ashaw was, after yeah. Hamburger Hill, the yeah. Ashaw seemed pretty quiet. Okay. Now, was there a point when the monsoon sets in and they have to pull out of there? Yes. I think that they pulled out in uh, late 69. I mm -hmm. think we pulled everything out of the Ashaw Valley um, and operated pretty much along the coastal mountains for the, for the monsoon season. Okay. Now, how much trouble does the weather create for a Chinook? Or are there conditions where you can't operate? Well, um, it was a fully instrumented helicopter and we flew in the weather in Vietnam up mostly to drop flares for the infantry at night. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one particular night where it was low clouds, drizzly and rainy that we had a flare mission and I took off out of Liftmaster and was in the clouds within five or six hundred feet mm -hmm. and pretty much spent the whole time in the clouds flying and uh, there was a radar controller that would guide us out to the drop zone and then we'd set up a racetrack pattern and drop, and then the, the infantry radio man on the ground would adjust that drop zone mm -hmm. based on where the light was. And one of the things that really was striking was the first time I went on a flare mission at night uh, in the clouds, we dropped the flares, and when the flare ignited, the flare would drop and the parachute would come out, and then it would float down and provide, I don't know how many thousand candle power of light, mm -hmm. each one. Um, the whole the whole cockpit lit up. The clouds lit up like it was daytime. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'd go out and it'd be dark again. Uh, and we'd stay up there, oh, I don't know how many flare. We had a, a crate in the back with all the flares in it. Mm -hmm. And we'd stay up there till the flares were gone and then go back. Okay. Uh, and then what kinds of supplies would you carry? We carried mostly uh, ammunition, food, and water, and fuel, mm -hmm. and, and sling loads. Most of our most of our flights were sling loads. So and they're then, hanging below the aircraft rather than inside it. Correct, in nets. Mm -hmm. And then when an artillery battery would move, we would move them. We'd go up to the hill where they're located, pick the tubes up, take them to the new location, <coughs> and drop them off. And we called it an arty move. And and most of our unit, if we were assigned an arty move, most of our unit would work on that one mission together until the entire battery was moved, and then we'd go off and do other missions. All right. Um, was there cargo that was harder to transport than others? <clears throat> uh, it was usually based on weight. A 155 howitzer is a lot heavier than a 105. Um, some of our other missions would involve going get and recovering down helicopters. And the Cobra was a very heavy helicopter. Mm -hmm. We had to be quite low on fuel to pick up a Cobra. I remember distinctly uh, a Cobra that was shot down and sitting on a sandbar in a river um, with high ridge lines on each side. And we were resupplying a fire base and flying over that site. And, and there was a lot of talk on the radio about how we we're gonna get that Cobra out of there. And I was flying uh, some of the Chinooks were, were more powerful than others, mm -hmm. I, I guess. I'm not sure why, but we had, uh, and they and our some of our aircraft had been upgraded to what were called Super Cs, where they had bigger engines. And I was flying a Super C that day, mm -hmm. and I, to, I told uh, everybody on the radio, I said, I think I've got, I'm down to a fuel load where I think I can pick that Cobra up. 
I said, I'm going to go down and give it a try. So I went down and the riggers were down there. And I went down and hovered over the Cobra and, and picked it up. And I got it off the ground and I got it off high enough that the crew chief thought it was safe to go. So we took off and I took off down the river to gain airspeed mm -hmm. and, and I started climbing. And I climbed and I climbed and I climbed and I'm looking up at these ridge lines like, golly, we got a ways to go yet. And then you're thinking about, I wonder how many NBA can see us flying slowly, climbing with this cobra slung underneath us. Um, but we retrieved it, and uh, it was one of those memorable moments in flying in Vietnam because when we got back to Camp Evans with the cobra, and we had, we must have had a hundred foot sling on it. So we're hovering a hundred feet in the air, setting this thing down very gently, and set it down and release the sling and the, the maintenance and the pilots from the Cobra Company were down there and they were just cheering and waving and <laughs> because we brought their Cobra back to them. All right. Uh, now, it, you said that the first several months you're, you're there were fairly quiet in terms of having to deal with enemy. Uh, do things get more intense later on? Um, one thing I... Things seemed to escalate slowly mm -hmm. during the monsoon season. Mm -hmm. One thing, that, the, so the things we worried about in the monsoon season were getting up to the fire bases in the clouds. Yeah. You know, we had guys that actually hovered up the side of mountains to, to get up to fire bases to resupply. Mm -hmm. We had other guys who got to the fire base with the low clouds, um, but when they got right over the fire base, went into the clouds and that's a pretty urgent situation because you really can't start letting down because you don't know what you're letting down into. So you have to take off, you have to accelerate in the clouds mm -hmm. and come back around and, and uh, get radar vectors or whatever you might get to get out of the clouds and then try again to get back up to the fire base. Uh, but as long as you maintained visual with the ground mm -hmm. or basically the trees out in front of you, you could actually hover up the side of a mountain if you had enough clearance so that your sling load didn't drag through the trees, mm -hmm. um, uh, you could get up to the fire base and resupply because we were the only, we were their only lifeline for food, water, ammunition. Um, the other thing that was happening occasionally, and I only know of a couple instances, was that the NBA would get on the radio and they would intercept you on the radio, assuming you, uh, they would imitate the ground control, the, the GCA approach controller, and they'd start radar vectoring you. And they actually radar vectored a cobra into the mountains uh, on one occasion. And I was out there flying on a flare mission one night, and we were being vectored back to Fubai. Mm -hmm. And the controller had us going west for some reason, and I told my co-pilot, I said, if we go west for one more minute, I said, we're turning around and heading for the coast and letting down onto the water, because I, I wasn't sure who I was talking to. Mm -hmm. And then he turned us back, and it was actually a, one of our guys, and, and vectored us back into Fubai. Um, but that's, that's, as I recall, that's about the time that things started to change in terms of hostile activity mm -hmm. in i -Corps for us. Okay. Uh, and now for the uh, ground units and so forth, I mean, they're up in, until about March of 1970. They're mostly kind of in, in the lowlands or in the foothills and not going farther inland too much. There were some Correct. missions up to the DMZ and things like that. Uh, now, did you also support uh, like the Arvin First Division or the Marines? We did. We haul, um, when we hauled the Arvins, uh, some of those flights were interesting because they would take animals with them. Um, I know we had one load where we were carrying ammo for them and they had ducks in the net mm -hmm. and the, when, when the ammo crates, we picked the load up in the net and that pushed the ammo crates together and some of the ducks were down in between the crates and of course got smashed. Mm -hmm. They probably ate them first when they <laughs> got to the fire base. Yeah. And I had a load of uh, Arvins that I picked up inside uh, the aircraft one day and we took off and we're headed out to a fire base and 
I looked down at the, the Chinook had a little, the, the cockpit was separate from the back and there was a little companionway, we called mm -hmm. it, that when I, she went through to get into the seat. And I looked down and there was a pig standing in the companionway. <laughs> and I told, I said over the intercom, I said, Chief, get that damn pig out of the cockpit with you. Uh, he was just standing there looking at the instruments. Yeah, well, the soldiers brought their own food with them. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, now, in March of 1970, the 101st makes their first effort to uh, set up what would become Firebase Ripcord. Mm -hmm. um, and that mission aborted, and then they try a second one the 1st of April, and then eventually in the middle of April they start. Uh, now, how much were you involved with that stuff? I re remember the insert into Ripcord uh, vaguely. It was just another Firebase insert. Mm -hmm. We'd take a dozer up there. We carried a, what was called a mini dozer. It was a very, heavy, very heavy load. We would take the body of the dozer up there, and then we would take the tracks and the blades separately, and then the troops would assemble the dozer up on the hill, and then they would use the bulldozer to doze off the top of the hill and create the, the the setting or the ground for the fire base, and then we would pull the dozer off and bring in the artillery and all their supplies and do an arty move. Um, and then it was after that, up until it it uh, was evacuated, it was a matter of resupplying Ripcord. And initially, uh, we could fly in there, and they, they Ripcord was a two tiered fire base. They had an upper on the hill where the guns were, and they had a lower area that was called the log pad, and the log pad was just to the north-northeast of the hill proper, and that's where we drop our loads. And then they had a little trail between the two where they'd take their supplies up to the hill. Um, so we would come in in the lower log pad, and it was just a routine resupply for the first, I guess, couple of months. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we were resupplying Ripcord, and then it be, then it got hot. Okay. Now, before it got hot at Ripcord, uh, had you had other situations or places where you were taking enemy fire or getting shot at? Um, I got shot at four times that I know of uh, in Vietnam. Uh, we were on a routine supply back in the fall of '69 out to um, Rendezvous in the Yashaw Valley. And the crew chief came up in the cockpit one day with a AK-47 round in his hand. <clears throat> and we looked at it and said, where'd you get that? And he said, I looked up and he said there was a hole in the soundproofing. He said it must have come through the cargo hole. And it was lodged in the soundproofing overhead and he took it out. Um, and then um, the second time I got shot at, I was on a flare mission over the ash shot. We were dropping flares over Firebase uh, Henderson, I believe, on the east side of the Ashaw Valley. And when we briefed for the mission, um, part of the briefing indicated that there was a 37 millimeter anti-aircraft site on the west side of the valley across from Henderson. And we were at 11,000 feet with the lights out. And we'd been up there dropping flares for probably 40 to 45 minutes. And the crew chief, my, or my right door gunner, uh, as I was turning in the racetrack pattern, right after a drop, he said, we're taking fire. We're taking, and he got real excited. He said, we're taking fire, sir, we're taking fire. It's coming up through the rotor system. And I started jinking, you know, and getting away mm -hmm. to the left. And I said, okay, they, they know we're up here. I said, we're going we're gonna to depart and let the C-130 come in and drop from high altitude. Mm -hmm. And the pathfinder on the ground was just begging for, he says, we got to have light. We're in hand-to-hand -hand combat down here, and we don't know the good guys from the bad guys, and we're trying to clear these bunkers. And I, I said, okay. I said, they didn't get that close. So I turned around, and I went back in. Mm -hmm. And about my third pass, I saw it was flak in front of flash bulbs, just like, just like getting your picture taken. And it was level at our altitude. And I turned, made a sharp bank, and got out. I said, all right, we've got to leave now. We're mm -hmm. going to get hit. So we had to leave the area. That was the second time I got shot at. 
The third time I got shot at was uh, on what was known as Operation Lifesaver. The gen commanding general apparently wanted an emergency landing zone in every thousand meter grid square in uh, I Corps, mm -hmm. in our area of operation. So our mission was to pick up uh, combat engineers and take them out to an area that had been selected as a, an emergency landing zone on a hilltop and drop them off in the morning. They would clear trees, blow stumps, and create a landing zone big enough, ideally for at least a Huey, and <clears throat> then we'd go pick them up in the afternoon. Sometimes when we dropped them off, we could get the back wheels on the ground and hover the front end, and then they could lower the ramp and just get off in, a, in the LZ. Other times we had a 70-foot cable ladder that they would go down off the ramp. <clears throat> well, in this case, uh, we couldn't land. They had to go down the cable ladder. And when we were on our way out there, um, the, the Pathfinder, who they put a security force on the ground before we would go in. The Pathfinder asked, he says, where are you guys? I said, well, we're, we're en route, we're about five minutes out, and we were pretty high, stay out of small arms range. Um, we were probably flying at four or 5,000 feet. And I asked him, I said, uh, is the area cold? Yeah, he said, the uh, infantry got on the ground, not a shot fired. I said, okay. And I looked over at my co-pilot, I said, Jeff, they're gonna get somebody killed in this mission one of these days. <clears throat> and so I, th I was the company instructor pilot by that time, and I was given, um, my co-pilot was Jeff Brockmeyer, and he was upgrading to aircraft commander, so I was giving him an aircraft commander check. Mm -hmm. And I told him when we started, I said, Jeff, I know you, how to, you know how to fly the aircraft. I said, you run the mission, I'll fly the aircraft. If you have any questions, just ask me. So I was flying and I came into the LZ at a high hover, and the I dropped off the sling load, and the sling load was dynamite, gasoline, chainsaws to clear the area. And um, right after we dropped off the sling load, uh, all hell broke loose. Uh, I heard a lot of popping. It sounded like uh, what I recall, uh, the sound of being on a basic training firing range with all the, everybody shooting. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, everything happened very fast. And about that time, a round went through the cockpit, plexiglass flying, and Jeff, my co-pilot, threw his hands up in his face. I thought he was hit. And the crew chief said, we got people hit back here. We got oil all over the place. Well, I instinctively, when that happened, they hadn't, hadn't put out the ladder yet, thank goodness. And there was nobody, so there was nobody on the ladder. But I instinctively pulled off the hill started going down the ridge line, <clears throat> down towards the valley, and our caution panel lit up like a Christmas tree, and I saw the oil transmission pressure caution light come on. So, and Jeff was talking to the um, Cobra gunship pilot on the radio. Oh, let me cancel that. <clears throat> Sorry. to call you back. I'm going to turn this off. <coughs> yeah, Harold's a modern technology. Okay. So, so Jeff was talking to the Cobra pilots, <coughs> and I was, I saw the transmission oil pressure light, so I, there's five transmissions in the Chinook, and there's a selector that will tell you what the pressure is in each one individually. When I got to the main transmission, the pressure gauge went all the way to zero. And I said, Jeff, they got the C-box, we're going to have to set it down. <clears throat> and I'm going down the, towards the, I'm looking for a place to go. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking down in the river bottom, and there's no place to go down there. And about that time, Jeff was talking on, on, the, on the radio, and he switched over to intercom. Apparently the Cobra pilots were looking at me at the angle that we were going and saying, are you going to make it? Are you going to make it? And, and 
Jeff says, are we going to make it? And I said, hell yes, we're going to make it. And I pulled back on the cycling, did what they, we call a cyclic climb and pitched the nose up. And now I'm looking at the next ridge line. And there's a break in the trees. I said, we're going in right up there. I said, get the 60s off the mounts, put them at 2 and 10 o'clock position, get somebody off the tail. And I said, we're going in up there, and I don't know we're going, what we're going into. Get ready to duke it out with whoever's there, because we got to land. So I got up, coasted to a stop, and, and that was ironically a previous Operation Lifesaver landing zone. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't quite at the top of the hill, so I set the, the Chinook down, and it started to roll, and I picked it back up, and I hovered up the hill a little ways, and there was a, about a two-foot or three-foot tree stump, and I planted the front end on the tree stump and, and let, slowly let it down, and it settled, and everything was stable, and we just pulled everything to stop, and, you know, we got guys screaming in the back. Uh, we had, we had uh, 16 people in that aircraft, five crew members and 11 combat engineers. Out of the 11 combat engineers, nine of them were shot. Mm -hmm. My left door gunner had a round in the hip. And uh, the Huey came in and landed behind us and took um, nine out of the 11. We had two wounded guys that stayed on the hill because the Huey couldn't take everybody, mm -hmm. but he took the most critical ones. Two of those combat engineers ended up dying, as I, as I was told mm -hmm. later. Um, and they had a ready reaction force that would come out and, and uh, rescue downed helicopter crews. And they activated the ready, the rescue force, and we could hear the Hueys orbiting way off in the distance. You can hear a Huey from a long ways. And, you know, my thought was, why aren't they coming to get us? Well, we weren't on the hill more than about five minutes after the Huey had come in and took our wounded guys. And we heard this, uh, it was an artillery shell coming in. And it sounded just like in the movies. It comes whistling in and there's a big explosion and the ground shakes. And I, I asked my, uh, the, the, one of our door gunners had been an infantry troop. He, <clears throat> and I said, what the hell was that? He said, that's our artillery. There was a fire mission going from somewhere east of us. They were firing at what I didn't know at the time, but was what a North Vietnamese regimental base camp area was based at the base of this hill, mm -hmm. not far from Ripport. <coughs> so finally the Hueys came in. The Cobras stayed with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't talk to them because they shot out all our radios and our, our uh, survival radio didn't work. But they kept making, they weren't shooting, but they were making gun runs. Mm -hmm. um, and they stayed with us and the Huey finally came in and uh, the infantry was very impressive. I'll never forget that. They came in, they got off the Huey, they huddled up just like a football team. And, and uh, the lieutenant said, all right, set, you know, you guys here, you guys there. And he, he uh, designed the perimeter. He said, and it's just like, okay, break. And they all spread out and did their thing. And then he came up to me and he said, who's the aircraft commander? I said, I am. He said, well, sir, you picked an interesting place to go down. I said, why is that? He said, he pulled out his map, he said, we're on the top of this hill right here. He said, all around the base of this hill is a North Vietnamese regimental base camp area. <laughs> and I said, that's very interesting, how soon are we going to get off this hill? <laughs> um, so the Huey that had taken the wounded guys to the hospital came back and picked us up. We were on the hill for an hour and ten minutes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> we had radioed back once the infantry got on the ground. We'd radioed back to the our our company. <clears throat> the crew chief went up and inspected the damage and thought if we they they hit the return oil line from the main transmission, and he said if you send the line out and some oil, we'll uh, we can fix it right here and fly it out of here. <clears throat> and our commander radioed back. He said, No, you guys have had enough for one day. We're getting you off the hill. So they evacuated us. And Jeff and I were sitting in my hooch, having a beer, <laughs> at about three in the afternoon. And uh, somebody came racing in and said, 502 was shot down and, and uh, it crashed. I said, no, it didn't. I said, we were in it. It's just, <laughs> it's sitting out there. No, no, the maintenance crew went out and they, they recovered the aircraft and they crashed. 
Ooh. So the, the maintenance, so what happened was the, the commander sent uh, two maintenance pilots and two maintenance technicians out to the hill with the line and the oil and they fixed it and they cranked it up and did a hover check. Everything checked out. So they took off and headed direct for home. And I had told Jeff, I said, if we get this thing fixed, I said, we're going from here to Ripcord because it's only about three or four minutes and set it down and check it out. Mm -hmm. um, well, they took off, climbed altitude and headed for Fubai. After they were at altitude, the oil that had leaked out of the transmission had streamed down by the engines and it caught fire. So the whole back end of the aircraft was on fire. And they made an emergency landing. They crash landed on a on a, a sandbar at a place called Three Forks, uh, which is south of Ripcord a ways. <clears throat> and the the they they hit the sandbar so hard that the front the cockpit broke off at the cockpit slice and went into the river, underwater, <clears throat> with the two pilots in it. The true maintenance two maintenance technicians were thrown out the opening that was created when the cockpit was gone, and they were in the river. They had made a mayday call when they went down, and another Chinook went in and picked them up. They all survived, mm -hmm. um, and they were at relatively uninjured. They had some burns because by the time they got on the ground, the pilots told me that the flames were lapping up in the cockpit. Um, but they they survived. But the air, the aircraft never made it back. It, it burned right on the sandbar. All right, this tape is about up, so we are going to pause here. Okay, so we kind of got into sort of concluding your third adventure. That was the third, at, third time I got shot at. <clears throat> the fourth time I got shot at um, was I was actually giving a new pilot an in-country orientation ride. So when a new pilot came in, you'd get in the aircraft with somebody, usually a company instructor pilot, mm -hmm. and then just basically tour the area. Here's our area of operation, and we were up west of Quang Tri, by uh, a place called um, uh, uh, Firebase, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but we were just south of the DMZ, and I, I said, well, I'll show you a little further west, which we, we didn't really have anybody out there, mm -hmm. but I was basically pointed towards Quezon, mm -hmm. and uh, I made a turn to go back to the south, and I could hear the, we started taking fire, I could hear bullets. Well, there was, apparently there was a 50 caliber machine gun in a culvert uh, in one area, and he would roll it out and shoot at helicopters and then roll it back into the culvert. And, and the Cobras finally got him, but uh, he shot at us, and you could hear rounds going by the aircraft. Um, and we, we exited the area. Fortunately, they didn't hit us. Okay. Now, were you flying to Ripcord in July of 1970 when yes. things got interesting? So talk about that phase. Uh, that was pretty exciting. Um, my technique for getting in and out of Ripcord uh, when it was really under siege and being mortared regularly uh, was to fly directly at the mountain with a sling load, do a cyclic climb, and time it so that you slowed down and basically came to a stop right over the lower log pad and set your load down, release it, and get out. And it wasn't uh, uncommon for us to be leaving the, the fire base and hearing mortars land behind us because when, when we hovered in to drop off a load, we created a lot of dust. And the NBA could see the dust, they'd put the mortars in the tubes and we'd be gone by the time the mortars came down and hit the fire base. Uh, but it, I, at least three or four times when I brought loads in there, uh, it was, uh, it was, I could hear mortars landing. Okay. Did you always put the loads on the log pads or did you ever put them anywhere else on the base? No, we were told uh, back at, during that time, if, if you put your nose up on top of the hill, you're probably going to get shot. Mm -hmm. So we stayed below the basically used the top of the hill to screen us from small arms fire mm -hmm. on the lower log pad. All right. Uh, uh, 
But now eventually a, a Chinook does get shot down over ripcord, and they're over the artillery positions at the time. Yeah. They're doing that. And I was told they were actually trying to put some of the artillery rounds closer to where the guns were. That, that must have been their... Uh, what they were probably doing is trying to put the load right next to the guns mm -hmm. so that they didn't have to go down to the lower right, log. Right, on top of the ammo bunker. And haul much. them up there. Yeah. So they were going to put them right in the ammo bunker. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they got shot. And the Chinook uh, crashed on top of the ammo mm -hmm. bunker and basically blew the entire supply of ammunition up over, it, it cooked off over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, and I talked to one of the infantry lieutenants who was quite a ways from Ripcord and he said there was shrapnel and, and debris landing in the trees around them as that was cooking off. Um, I personally was actually in Saigon that day picking up a brand new Chinook mm -hmm. with, with one of our maintenance pilots. We were on our way back and when we got back late in the afternoon the routine for bringing in a new aircraft was to do a flyby over the company area, a high speed pass mm -hmm. and then come in and land. But we made a high speed pass over the, over the company and I looked down and almost all the Chinooks were gone. And I called the company ops, I said, what's going on? I said, uh, he said, well, the ripcord, um, he told me that they'd had a, the ammo supply at ripcord was blown up, and they're up there doing an attack emergency resupply. So they resupplied them at that point, but um, that's when things got really hot. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, did you go with ripcord again before the day they evacuated? I went in and out of there several times before, yeah, while, while it was, I, I call it under siege, I guess. Yeah, well, it was under siege. It was under siege. Uh -huh. um, because we were the only resupply line they had. The Hueys could get in there and haul troops in, but they mm -hmm. couldn't haul very much ammo, and, yeah. and they didn't haul ammo. And at this point, I mean, the, the, the 105 battery is not operational, so there's just the 155s up there. But were you bringing out 105 ammunition in expectation that they would put another battery there? I honestly don't know. Okay. We were carrying um, high explosive mm -hmm. artillery rounds. Yeah. Uh, we usually would would call in to the Pathfinder and say we got our load of 105 HE, mm -hmm. but I don't recall what I was calling in at the time. Yeah. Because there was thought of bringing in another battery to replace the one that, 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 um, that, got, that, that had been knocked out. Because the guns were destroyed. Yeah. The, yeah. So. <coughs> Anyway, okay, and then now we get to the 23rd of July uh, when they actually evacuate the fire base. And what do you remember about that day? We had a briefing the night before in our ops. They called all the pilots in and, and briefed us and told us what we were going to be doing the next day. And uh, one of the things they said was, um, I don't under, actually, I assume they did, but they told us that the first load going in there was going to be a bulldozer. If you got shot down on the hill, get out of the aircraft because they're going to bulldoze it off the side of the hill. Mm -hmm. um, and then they asked for volunteers. And I was sitting in the back, and of course my hand went up, mm -hmm. and uh, the ops officer said, Meyer, put your hand down, you're going home. I was, the, the next day was my last flying day in Vietnam. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, they took volunteers, crews, and then the ops officer came up to me afterwards and he said, we're going to need you to be on standby. So he said, I'm, we're going to have you in the revetment with the APU running, listening to the radios, and if we call you, you're going to need to launch. So um, we, we did just that. They they, our, our company launched and the other companies launched and went out and extracted the tubes off of ripcord. Um, and we were listening to it on the radio and about, there was a lot of aircraft getting hit and going in, in and out of there. Um, some of them disabled and had to go back and land. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of the mission, they, the ops officer called and said, we need you to launch. And I thought, uh, this isn't gonna be good. <laughs> I don't know, I just had the sense that if I go up there that today, I'm not coming back. Um, so we cranked up, taxied out to the end of the, the 
takeoff, where the takeoff pad was, and we were ready to take off, called for clearance to take off, and the ops officer called us. He said, they're done. Taxi back in and shut mm -hmm. it down. Uh, that was quite a relief. So I wasn't actually in on the extraction. Okay. And you were in all the stuff in before it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So at this point now, um, do they pack you up and send you back to the States, or what do you do next? Um, we uh, packed up, had a little going away party in the officer's club, uh, packed all my stuff, uh, got on a C-130 at Fubai, and flew down to Chula, um, Cameron, Cameron, Bay. Bay. Yep. Cameron Bay, Cameron Bay. And spent the night there. <clears throat> a group of us commandeered a deuce and a half and went down to one of the, actually one of the local off base restaurants and had Vietnamese food. Um, and then left on a freedom bird, as they called them, the next day. Okay. Uh, some to kind of back up a little bit to sort of life in, in Vietnam. Uh, what was daily life like when you weren't flying? We played a lot of poker, drank a lot of beer. People it, asked me what I did in Vietnam. I said, well, I flew all day one day and I drank all day the next. <laughs> I didn't actually do that. But. Now, did they? Did you ever get, go off base? Uh, I went off base one time into Way on a tour. Mm -hmm. We toured Way, way uh, the Citadel, I guess they called it. Yeah. Um, that was an interesting tour. To, to The Tet Offensive had done a lot of damage yeah. and there was just the walls were marked with bullet, uh, yeah, bullet marks all mm. over the place. Um, and, but that's the only time I recall, other than R&R, &R, mm -hmm. uh, getting off base. Okay. And where did you go on R&R? &R? I went to Hawaii. Okay. So were you married at the time? I or? was. Okay. Married. Uh, had my oldest son, uh, I left for Vietnam. Uh, one or two days before his first birthday. Mm -hmm. That was pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my wife was pregnant when I left, and my second son was born. I left and was uh, entered Vietnam in August. He was born in November. Mm -hmm. I didn't see him until he was, uh, what was he, nine months old. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went on R&R &R and uh, met my wife in Hawaii, spent a week there, and then went back to Vietnam. Okay, so what's it like having to go back to Vietnam? Pretty depressing. Mm -hmm. um, when you're you're back out of the out of the combat environment, out of the stress, out of the risk, uh, you feel safe and and uh, it was relaxing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now um, there's lots of kind of stereotypes about Vietnam and life in Vietnam and that kind of thing. And one of them is, particularly on the bases, there were a lot of issues with drug use and race relations and so forth. Did you observe any of that yourself or? Not in our company. We had, uh, I think we had two different, they called them shakedown inspections, where the officers would go down and go through the enlisted barracks mm -hmm. looking for drugs. And I remember one of those for sure, I can't remember, but I think we might have done that a second time, but mm -hmm. we didn't find anything. Mm -hmm. And that was the, that was the only uh, experience with that concept the whole time I was there. Mm -hmm. And I guess, and so you're, and your company was kind of in its own sort of self-contained area, area pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're not really <clears throat> seeing sort of large numbers of other base personnel yeah. and things like that. Uh, did you have any Vietnamese civilians working on the base? We had uh, the maids would come in and, and clean our rooms, make our beds, and do laundry for us. Um, but they were there only during the day. They mm -hmm. were moved off base at night. I, I think apparently they caught one guy walking off distances in our company area and mm -hmm. got him off the base. We got rocketed when I first got to Vietnam. We got rocketed at night uh, every so often. And I, I think what they were aiming for, there was an antenna field just to the north of where we were living. Mm -hmm. And I think they were aiming for that antenna field, but you could hear the rockets come in and you'd scramble to get in the bunker. We'd go in the bunker, and, and that was kind of frightening because you never knew while you were running to the bunker if the next rocket was going to land right next to you. Um, 
we did have uh, a rocket hit one of our bunkers, and we had some pilots in there. They weren't injured, but it, it, was, it was a good thing they were in the bunker. Right. Uh, now, did that rocketing, did that stop at a certain point? It seems to me that it stopped about the time the monsoon season started. Um, we would sit out on our, we had a deck off the back of our officers club on the south side of the building, and we would sit out there at night and watch um, cobras working in the lowlands. Mm -hmm. You could see there are tracers coming down, and you could see, th they called them dusters. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether they were quad 50s or what they were, but mm -hmm. we called them dusters, and you could see their tracers going out, um, firing. But that, <clears throat> a lot of that activity seemed to stop about the time the monsoon season started. And the, during the monsoon season, there were times where we didn't fly for up to a week at a time. And we had one, we had one storm that dropped 23 inches of rain in 24 hours. Okay. So once you get back uh, from Vietnam, what do you do next? I, when I was in, uh, I got my assignment out of Vietnam. I was assigned to Fort Benning, Georgia, because I had taken a direct commission. The Army was short on commissioned officers. Mm -hmm. um, they were offering direct commissions if you had, if you were a chief warrant officer grade two, which mm -hmm. I was, um, and if you had a certain number of semester hours of college credit, so right. I qualified. And um, so the, um, I don't know, we were kind of ornery as warrant officers. Mm -hmm. And I was actually going on R&R &R when that notice came out. And my roommate, who was the admin officer, called me and he, and I was in the officers club at the crane unit in Da Nang waiting for my flight to mm -hmm. Hawaii the next day. And he, I'm in the officers club and, and I get a phone call and I went, uh-oh, somebody died or something because you never got a phone call mm -hmm. in Vietnam. <clears throat> and it was my roommate. And he told me that the Army was offering direct commissions if you had the qualifications. And he, uh, and he said, I think that... I don't know, four or five or six of us that qualified. And I, sa I said, what are they offering? He said, second lieutenant. I said, what branch? He said, infantry, artillery, armor, and signal. I said, um, what do you, so what do you think we ought to do? He says, well, we're all going to, we're all going to apply. He said, we can always turn it down if it comes, when it comes back. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're all going to apply. I said, I said, what? He said, what, do you want to apply? I said, well, I guess so. He said, what branch? I said, signal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, okay. I said, what do we have to do? He said, we got to sign a postcard and send it back to DA, Department of the Army. <clears throat> I said, okay, well, sign a postcard for me and send it back. Um, so we did. When I got back from R&R &R on the bulletin board in the officers club, it, and like I said, we were kind of ornery. Somebody, one of the warrant officers, had put up a little notice. Send in your picture postcard and 10 C ration box tops for a direct commission to second lieutenant. <laughs> 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 and so in July, I was due to go home in August. Mm -hmm. In July, the, the commissions came down. And I was being commissioned second lieutenant infantry. Mm-hmm. So I decided, since I was so close to going home, and one of the questions I had from my admin officer, my, my roommate, was, hey, they're going to commission us as second lieutenants and send us to the field as grunts. Mm -hmm. He said, no, they can't do that. We're not qualified. He said, we're going to be pilots. I said, okay. So I took the direct commission. Mm -hmm. Well, because I was infantry, they were going to send me to Fort Benning, Georgia. I didn't want to go to Fort Benning, Georgia. I wanted to go to Fort Rucker and be a flight instructor. Mm -hmm. So I went to Fort Rucker. I, I actually got my orders changed and went to Fort Rucker. How did you get your orders changed? I don't recall exactly, but I, I'm sure I sent in a, a request, a, mm -hmm. t a twix, as we call them. It's like a fax mm -hmm. nowadays. Uh, sent a, a twix back to DA, and, and they changed my orders. So I went to Fort Rucker, 
uh, from Vietnam. I got back in, uh, uh, would have been August, because mm -hmm. we were there exactly a year, um, and was assigned to the student battalion in the uh, administrative office. And basically my job, my primary job, was to coordinate the graduation parties and to make sure that the colonels all got seated by data rank and mm -hmm. you didn't see one colonel whose wife didn't like the other colonel <laughs> wife next to each other. And that was my job. In the, I was in S1, I believe it's called. So I was there for six months. <coughs> After I was there, <coughs> they told me, we're going to put you in here for six months and then if you want to go fly, you can. So once I was there for six months, I requested reassignment to the to Shell Army Heliport where we did instrument training in the mm -hmm. TH-13 and that's what I did for the rest of my tour. Okay, so how long did you wind up doing that? Uh, from would have been uh, early, seven, early 1970 to 1972 when I got off active duty. Well, it wouldn't be early 1970 because... I'm sorry, late, no, 1970. late 1970. Okay. Early 1971. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I would have been in the battalion for six right, months. Right. From, yeah, you're right. From August to six months later, which would have been early '71, mm -hmm. and then I went to Shell Field and was an instructor. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, at this point, do you? What do you do next? I mean, do you stay in the military in, in some fashion, or? Um, uh, let me answer a question you asked early on. Okay. When I was assigned to Shell, <clears throat> we lived on an acreage that we found out in the country mm -hmm. on a dirt road, um, rented to us by a couple of um, bachelor peanut farmers mm -hmm. in a little farmhouse, tiny house. Um, you asked about, you were implying discrimination. Yeah. Um, when we left, uh, when, when I got reassigned um, after my tour was done, the landlord came to me and said, uh, now, you know, <clears throat> if you got any buddies that wanna, wanna live out here in a quiet country, he said, you, you let them know and, and steer them towards me and we'll rent them this house when you leave. And then he said, but, you know, we don't want, he, he wouldn't say, we don't want any black people out mm -hmm. here, but he implied that. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. I was from the Midwest, and mm -hmm. we didn't, there, there just wasn't the prejudice in the yeah. Midwest there was in the, in the South. So um, I said, yeah, I know what you mean. And then, and then I had another experience. We had a, uh, one of our instructor pilots uh, was African American and a very nice gentleman. I think, as I recall, his name was Danny Johnson. Had a nice family, good people. And he would call to rent. He was living on base, he mm -hmm. wanted to live off base. He would call to rent and they'd say, oh, you bet, we got this apartment, it's great, and come on out and take a look at it. He said they'd go up and knock on the door, they'd open the door and they said, you know, we just rented that 30 minutes ago. He had a heck of a time finding housing as a black person. Mm -hmm. So when we, I finished my tour, <coughs> um, my family and I moved back to Iowa and um, I had wanted to go back to, uh, initially when I left high school I enrolled at South Dakota State in pre-pharmacy mm -hmm. right. and I wanted to finish pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. So I did two things, I joined a guard unit because I wanted to keep my military experience going. Mm -hmm. And there happened to be a Chinook unit in Davenport, Iowa. So I joined the Chinook unit. <coughs> and we lived in Marshalltown, Iowa. And uh, just a week or so after I got out, my dad was a farmer, he had a heart attack. So we lived in Marshalltown and I helped a neighbor of ours farm our farm for that year while I went to junior college and a kind of a catch-up year I took mm -hmm. um, courses that were required for pharmacy school and then I had I was in the uh, Iowa Army National Guard and we went to summer camp at uh, um, 
Fort Ripley, Minnesota. And I was, my job that summer at Fort Ripley was to do instrument flight instruction in Huey. So we basically would get in a Huey. I'd get in a Huey with two students every morning and we'd fly around Minnesota. Mm -hmm. On one of those days, I actually flew a Huey from Fort Ripley down to Brookings, South Dakota and met with the Dean of Pharmacy. And I had been in school there before and I told him I wanted to come back and finish. <clears throat> and he said, well, if your grades are decent, I didn't have a very good grade point average when I left. Um, and uh, he said, if your grades are decent, he said, I'll consider putting you in the class. Mm -hmm. So when I finished summer camp, finished at Marshalltown Community College with a 4.0 grade point average, and called the, the dean, he said, I'll put you in the class. So at the time, pharmacy school was two years of pre-pharmacy and three years of pharmacy mm -hmm. school. Um, so I had finished my requirements for the first two years and he put me in the class for pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. So we moved from Marshalltown to Brookings, South Dakota, <clears throat> and I finished pharmacy school and graduated in 1976. All right. And then you go to work as a pharmacist at that point? I did. Uh, we moved down to Vermilion, South Dakota, um, where the medical school was, because when I was in pharmacy school, my last... My, uh, next to the last year, um, I was a second year pharmacy, second semester pharmacy student, and I took a course in pathology, and it was very interesting to me, so I went to see the pathology professor and said, you know, I might be interested in applying to medical school. But I thought, oh, well, it's, it's going to be a long shot because mm -hmm. of my grade point average and, I, and my age. I was 27 or 28 years old, and I sat there and talked to him for half an hour. And age kept coming up, mm -hmm. and he said, probably some of the best advice I ever got as, as a student. Um, he said, well, Meyer, let me ask you, how, how old are you? I said, I think it was 27. He said, all right, so you got a year and a half of pharmacy school left. You'll be 28, almost 29. Let's say it takes you a couple of years to get into medical school, you'll be 31. Four years of medical school, you'll be 35. Uh, two years of, a year of internship, 36. A couple of years of internal medicine residency, 38. You'll be 38 years old, you could be a board certified internist, internal medicine specialist. I said, oh my gosh, that's 11 years from now. He leaned back in his chair put his hands behind his head, and he said, let me ask you something, Meyer. Said, yeah, what's that, Dr. Johnson? How old are you going to be in 11 years from now if you don't do it? I said, that's a very good point, Dr. Johnson. <laughs> so I moved down to Vermillion. So the point is, I moved to Vermillion. That's where the medical school was. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a very good grade point average, although I did very well in pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. I maintained about a 3.75. Mm -hmm. I went down and started applying to medical school. Um, worked in our in a retail drugstore as a pharmacist. One of our customers was the dean of admissions for the medical school. He knew who I was. Mm -hmm. He knew what I was. I would go see him and talk to him about what I wanted to do. And I took the medical college admission test mm -hmm. because it had been so long since I had had biochemistry, for instance. Mm -hmm. My scores weren't very good. So I took a prep course for the medical college admission test and increased my scores and kept applying to medical school. I applied four years in a row. The third year, uh, the second year I applied, the dean told me, he said, uh, you didn't make the list, but he said, You're, you moved up significantly in the applicant pool because of my, of my better MCAT scores. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I'm going to apply again. He said, I'd recommend you do so. So I did. <coughs> the third year I applied, I was on the alternate list. <coughs> I was 13th alternate. I went to see the dean, and I said, what are my chances? He said, well, he said, you're on the alternate list, but he said, to be honest with you, we've never taken over seven alternates. I said, well... All right, I'm on the alternate list. I think I'm going to apply one more year. And he said, I would if I were you. So in the meantime, 
I, I applied that fourth year. I uh, was a registered pharmacist in a small town in South Dakota, not making very much money, counting pills and typing labels. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get out of the Army Guard and into the Air Force Reserve. Mm -hmm. So I found an Air Force Reserve unit at Selfridge Air National Guard Base in Michigan that was looking for pilots that had heavy helicopter time because they had H-3s. Mm -hmm. And they took me on. So I moved to Michigan and I actually worked full time for the uh, Air Force Reserve um, for that year while I was waiting to get into medical school. I didn't tell them I had applied to medical school because I, I, I just thought, well, they don't need to know that. So I worked out there and they were wanting me to take a full-time job mm -hmm. as a flight instructor. So I finally did, chief of safety flight instructor in H3. Well, they sent me off to, because I, I had transitioned from the Army Guard to the Air Force Reserve, they sent me to water survival training, land survival training, and a aviation safety officer course, which was taught at, at uh, Uh, the Air Force Base outside of San Bernardino, California. Okay. So I went out there. I was out there, it was like my, last day, my last week of class, and the phone rang. And again, that's the only time my phone rang ever in the BOQ I was staying mm -hmm. at. And I answered it, and it was a secretary from the medical school and said, we're going to accept you to medical school. Where are you? Where can <laughs> we, we need to send you some paperwork to have notarized and sent back to us. So I signed it and sent back sent it back, accepted a position, and, and, and medical school started in August of 1980. And for my training that I had gone through in the Air Force Reserve, I was obligated till September of 1980. So I had a problem. So I went back and I talked to my boss and I said, hey, I'm, uh, before I came out here a long time ago, I applied to medical school and I just found out last week I got accepted. And he says, what are you going to do? I said, well, I, accept, I applied so many years in a row. I, I need to do this. So I sent a letter to AFRES headquarters requesting release from my obligation, and they denied it. <clears throat> in the meantime, I wanted to stay in the military, so I had found a position in the 185th TAC Fighter Group in Sioux City in the Air, Iowa Air National Guard in the command post because they it required a rated officer but you didn't have to be A7 qualified. We had A7s at the time. So I wrote a letter back and I said, look, I th I've already got a position in, a, in an Iowa Air National Guard unit and I think the Air Force would be better off gaining a flight surgeon or a physician flight mm -hmm. surgeon as opposed to another pilot. And they agreed with me and they let me out of my <laughs> commitment. So I moved back to Vermilion and started medical school in, 19, uh, in August of, well, July of 1980. Okay. All right. Uh, and did you get through that successfully? I finished medical school in 1984. Uh, stayed in the guard <clears throat> the whole time. After medical school, uh, moved to uh, Michigan. I did an internship in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And then during my internship, I applied to go back on active duty in the Navy uh, and the Air Force. And my goal in the Navy was to become what was called a dual designator, to fly as a pilot in Navy jets mm -hmm. and be a flight surgeon at the same time. The Navy had that program. The Air Force didn't. So uh, as my internship went along, the Navy didn't get the paperwork done. The Air Force did. So I took the Air Force route mm -hmm. and went to flight surgeon training and was assigned to uh, Vance Air Force Base in Enid, Oklahoma. And after my internship, so we moved to Enid in, uh, oh, well, it would have been July of uh, 1984. I went on active duty until, it was a three-year commitment, so 84 to 87, I was on active duty in the Air Force. Okay. Uh, and what did your job consist of? We had a clinic <clears throat> on the base. It was clinic medicine. And our job as flight surgeons was to take care of the rated personnel. And the rated personnel consisted of 
student pilots, flight instructors, and air traffic controllers. So we saw a young, healthy population. Mm -hmm. It wasn't especially challenging. Um, so what I did was uh, I, uh, <coughs> I took a job part-time in the local, one of the hospital's local emergency rooms as an emergency room physician. So I moonlighted in the emergency mm -hmm. room while I was in the Air Force. Uh, and one of my one of my objectives was to keep my skills up because mm -hmm. you do flight medicine for three years and now you you know taking care of a heart attack is way back in the distance. So I was an emergency room physician. Well, when I finished the Air Force obligation in um, in eighty seven, I <clears throat> the local medical staff wanted me to take over the emergency room at the other hospital in town, which was expanding and building a new emergency room and building onto the hospital. So I agreed to do that. <clears throat> so I became a full-time emergency room physician uh, in Enid. Um, and I transferred, once I got off active duty, I rejoined the Iowa Air National Guard as a flight surgeon mm -hmm. in Sioux City. So I would attend drills in Sioux City and, and I worked full-time in, in Enid. And how would you get back and forth? I had my own airplane at the time, uh, okay. so I'd commute back and forth to... A long uh, drive, not so long a flight. Correct. And, and actually, there were times when the pilots from Sioux City, there was a low-level route that they would fly that went down into Kansas. Well, there was... Uh, occasionally, they would actually come down to Enid, to the Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and pick me up in an A-7. And we'd fly the low-level route back to Sioux City, <clears throat> and then Sunday afternoon, at the end of guard drill, we'd repeat the process, and they drop me off back in Eden, mm -hmm. which was a lot of fun for me. Okay. All right. Um, now you were been in the Air National Guard uh, in the period of the Gulf War in '91. Did that yes. have any ripple effects that got to your unit, or do things just stay normal? Um, we had, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a request or an offer for volunteers, mm -hmm. and we did have some people from our medical unit that volunteered for the Gulf War, and they were sent to, I know one of our physicians was sent to Florida to backfill mm -hmm. a physician's position that was, the, at, that was deployed right. to the Gulf War. So no one went to the Gulf, mm -hmm. but they, we had a few people that went to different places in the United States. Okay. All right. And then how long did you stay with the Air National Guard? Um, I, I was the, um, I started out as the Chief Flight Surgeon in the 185th Tech Clinic. Mm -hmm. And then I became the Clinic Commander. Um, and then my next assignment was uh, as the State Air Surgeon for the State of Iowa. So I switched from going to Sioux City. I went to Des Moines for drill, mm -hmm. and I was a state air surgeon for the Iowa Air National Guard. Okay. And when did you complete that assignment? Um, when I retired okay. in, in January of 2000. All right. Uh, now, you have been working in Enid, Oklahoma. You now live in Grand Island, Nebraska. How did that come about? Well, I um, was working as the emergency room physician. I ran, ran the emergency room, and I would hire other physicians to be the emergency room physician when I was not there. Mm -hmm. And I had a partner who was a medical school classmate of mine, and he and I basically took most of the hours, and then we'd use residents from Oklahoma City to fill in the rest. Mm -hmm. And I did that um, until uh, 1992. In late 91, the administrator of the hospital came down and was talking to me, and he said, you know, you're one of two physicians on our medical staff who do not have postgraduate medical education. Basically, I had just an internship mm -hmm. and experience. <clears throat> and he said, and the other one is retiring. <laughs> so I thought, well, all right, I probably need to go and do my specialty training. <clears throat> so my thought at the time, because of my pharmacy background, I had really when I left medical school I wanted to do anesthesia residency mm -hmm. um, and the internship I did was a lead into that and then during my internship I decided to change course and go to the back to the military for mm -hmm. a while 
So I, <clears throat> my choices were to do anesthesiology or do emergency medicine. The University of Oklahoma had an emergency medicine program. Um, the University of Kansas, Wichita, had an anesthesiology program. And they were, well, University of Wichita was a little further than Oklahoma City from Enid, but not much. So my thought at the time was, well, I'm already doing emergency medicine. I'm not sure I want to go and train for two years to do something I'm already doing. Mm -hmm. And my primary interest had always been anesthesiology. So I applied to the University of Kansas and completed the residency program at the University of Kansas Wichita Hospitals. Um, and that program ran from 1992 to 1995. In 1995, um, we moved to Woodward, Oklahoma, a small town in western Oklahoma. Um, and I was the only anesthesiologist there. <clears throat> we had a nurse anesthetist who was a nurse that does anesthesia. And we had um, uh, it, w it was a fairly busy, they had a new young, sur a couple of new young surgeons, and it was a fairly busy place. But I grew up in the Midwest around cornfields and bean fields, and I, now I was in an environment that looked like West Texas with mm -hmm. wind and dry and tumbleweeds, and if you didn't ride horses or chase rattlesnakes, there wasn't a whole lot to do in Woodward, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> and I was being, I was on call 24-7, <clears throat> and basically, I got tired of the routine and I told my wife, I said, moving back to the Midwest, I hope you're going with me. Um, so we moved to, I had a classmate who was um, from Grand Island where I live now and his father and his group, an orthopedic group, had plans to build their own ambulatory surgery center, so uh, Dr. Albers was calling me and telling me, encouraging me to come up. Well, I wanted to leave Oklahoma, so I actually interviewed in at a couple hospitals in Iowa, mm -hmm. and one at Topeka, um, and I knew of the opportunity in Grand Island, and ultimately decided to move to Grand Island. We've okay. lived there ever since. <coughs> Okay, so to look back on the whole thing, um, I mean, obviously, a lot, I mean, the standard question that I ask is sort of how do you think your time in the service affected you, or what did you take out of it? And uh, you said a lot about that already, but just in sort of just for yourself as a person, how do you think that this affected you? Well, I got out of the service, um, you know, I guess I'd have to say I got out of the service what I wanted flight training and experience. Um, because of the course I took in, in flight training and the Air Force Reserve and medical school and the flight surgeon, I, I mean, I had a terrific time in the military. Mm -hmm. I, I had a lot of opportunity. I got to do a lot of really neat things. I rode in the backseat of an A-7 all the way from Sioux City, Iowa to St. Troy in Belgium on a deployment for summer camp one year. Um, I, it, it was just a really, it was a good time. Got a lot of flying experience and enjoyed it. On the downside, uh, it took a toll on my personal life. Um, after Vietnam, I got divorced from my boys' mother mm -hmm. and uh, eventually was remarried to my current wife and we raised her two boys. My two boys finished college and are, are very successful. One is an insurance executive, one is actually a physician uh, anesthesiologist, pain doctor, just like myself, who lives in, now lives in Kansas. Um, we raised my wife's two boys. Um, one of them finished his degree at the University of Nebraska in psychology, and he actually works for us in the office, does helps do billing. Mm -hmm. uh, her oldest son just finished um, his undergraduate degree, and he's applying to PA school. And then we had a daughter who uh, was born in 1996, and she now is at the Oklahoma State University in their professional pilot program. Mm -hmm. I steered her towards aviation. Um, 
but I told her, I said, I want you to do this for you. I don't, you know, don't mm -hmm. do it for me. Just, this is something you seem to enjoy and be interested in. And I said, you can actually go to college and get a degree in aviation and learn to fly. And I said, the, 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 there's a pilot shortage going on, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to run for at least 10 years, and uh, the sky's the limit. I said, you know, and I've, we've talked when she's been home, and, and I said, you know, Elizabeth, you have the world by the tail if you play your cards right. And she just smiles and says, yeah, I know. So, so it took a toll on, our, on, on you know, my personal life, like it, I think it did for so many mm -hmm. Vietnam vets. Um, uh, it's just what life was like at the time. It's how things were. Mm -hmm. A lot of stress. All right. Uh, and you basically kind of, over time, le learned to manage it or deal or things quiet down over time? Or? Yeah, they, they have. Um, I think there are times when certain situations are difficult for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you saw a lot of difficult stuff and went through some very, very scary things, and those do, do leave a mark. But yeah. um, you've had certainly a very impressive career and makes for a very good story. So thank you very much for taking the time to share it today. You're welcome. Hi.